So uh, in this talk, I'm going to uh, go over some of the key uh, real-time machine learning infrastructure at Marketplace at Lyft. Uh, and I'm, I will also share the key learnings uh, while building this platform. My, na my name is Rakesh. I I'm senior staff engineer at uh, Marketplace. Uh, so um, when we talk about Marketplace, right, Marketplace is the lifeline of the business. And especially uh, for Lyft Marketplace, it is fluid and dynamic. So it is really essential for our marketplace or our ML infrastructure pieces to make, you know, uh, process all these data faster and provide this information to various uh, uh, systems. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll go over the various topics uh, and uh, cover the whole ecosystem, how it works. So these are the various topics that I'll cover in th this talk. So let's talk about uh, what is uh, Lyft. Uh, for those people who do not know what is Lyft, uh, Lyft is a ride-sharing company, and our goal is to basically match passenger with drivers and also keep them happy. And how we make them happy is basically provide them shorter ETA, uh, fair pricing, uh, fair driver pay, and timely notification to, uh, to our customers. To achieve all these things, uh, we have, like our systems have to make millions of decisions in real time, and Basically, our real-time ML infrastructure is powering all our systems. But before that, I would like to uh, cover some of the use cases, like what are different use cases are under marketplace and how we are powering them. So very first use case is dynamic pricing. I think whenever you book a ride, you must have seen sometimes prices fluctuate, and that is intentional, that is done by our system to ensure that like, we balance the marketplace uh, demand and supply. So basically, uh, if there is an imbalance in the marketplace, uh, the, our customers will not have a great experience, right? Uh, you know, passengers, they have to wait for a longer time to get a ride, whereas the drivers, they have to travel a, uh, like longer hours or longer uh, time to pick up a ride, which is not a great experience for both of them. And that is a catastrophic failure like, you know, like both of them can leave our platform. So it is really important that we have some kind of, uh, uh, kind of balancing mechanism, and that is the uh, dynamic pricing. So our system, what it does is basically it identifies that there is an imbalance in the uh, demand and supply, and then it increases the prices dynamically to dampen the demand. That way we control the demand and also balance the marketplace. And that also provides a kind of better reliable service reliability. Uh, to ensure a kind of fair pricing and fair driver pay, what we do is like uh, when we are adjusting the prices, we take into account about our demand and supply curves and ensure that like we are setting the prices at the right, like at the right level where, where we have a better throughput of the system. And to achieve all these things, our systems, they need the real-time data to make all these decisions in real time. If they do not get this information in real time, they will not be able to make, uh, like optimize the whole marketplace, and that, that will lead to a catastrophic failure of the platform. Similarly, uh, supply management. So I did talk about where there's an imbalance in uh, you know, demand and supply. When, when I say demand, that is basically number of ride requested, and when I say supply, that is number of drivers available in that area. So um, supply management is another use case, which is also essential. So um, uh, there are cases where we have a lot of supply in some geographic area, and in some other geographical area, we have less supply. So it, it is still a kind of a market imbalance, right? So to ensure, ensure that we have a kind of better marketplace condition, what we do is we, we influence driver by creating dynamic incentives. So by creating dynamic incentive, what we do is we are attracting driver to those geographical locations where there's less supply. That way, drivers are getting more incentive uh, to you know, provide uh, or stay on the platform for longer hour and provide more ride. That also improve our service reliability. And that this system also need uh, information or this machine learning model also need that uh, real-time information like what is the current demand in that area, what will be the demand in the next minute or maybe uh, five minutes from now, and how we are going to create dynamic incentive so driver can go and drive in those locations and provide uh, different ride, uh, uh, provide rides. 
And uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, like, we need to determine what, is going, uh, what will be the demand in the next minute or maybe next five minutes or half an hour. So that is another use case uh, that is short-term forecasting. So short-term forecasting is really crucial for our marketplace because there are lots of machine learning models. They are making all these decisions. They cannot make the decision at, uh, for, the, uh, for the current timestamp or current uh, snapshot, right? They, they have to look forward, right, and see what will be the demand and supply in the given, a, uh, in the given uh, time frame, right? And they want to optimize this value, right, uh, for the current minute and also keeping that in mind, like what will be the demand and supply in future. So uh, the forecasting basically models or uh, infrastructure is detecting or trying to predict what will be the demand and supply uh, uh, in the, like five minutes, 10 minutes, or 15 minutes or so. And for this, like you, again, you, st again, you need a kind of real-time information. Otherwise, if you're not uh, getting all these real-time information uh, uh, right, then you, your forecasting will be, you know, diverge from the actual. Then the last one is also very important uh, use case, that is fraud detection. So in general, fraud detection is really expensive for any business, right? And uh, especially the effect get compounded if transactions are happening in real time, right? Uh, like if you, your system is not able to detect the fraud in real time, then the, the, it will be really expensive. Like once the damage is done, then you will realize that there is a kind of a fraud, and which is bad, right? So what you do is like you need to have a kind of real-time system uh, to get all these data points and pass it to the fraud model. And fraud model can basically detect whether there is a kind of risk of fraud over here, and if there is a risk of fraud, then intervene or block that before it is happening. So I, I think these are like some of the use cases. This is, but it is not limited to these, these uh, use cases. There are many more use cases uh, which are currently powered by real-time ML infrastructure. So uh, then I can uh, talk about like what is the high-level architecture uh, of the system. So in any ML infrastructure, there are three core pieces. One is the feature, uh, the second one is the model training, and the third one is model inference or model serving. So for this one, I'm mainly focusing on the real-time infrastructure piece, which is generating all these features in real time. So what we have over here is there are two different pipelines. So one pipeline is which is basically called ingestion pipeline. So it, it is ingesting the data from various sources like driver app, passenger app, uh, uh, passenger app and various uh, systems which are generating all this data. And then, and then it is ingesting them, filtering them, and also, it is acting as a kind of a state machine, which is keeping track of all the data points generated by various, uh, generated for uh, individual like driver and passenger, and then uh, passing on uh, this to the downstream pipelines or services. This is like semi-processed data, but yet it's high quality. The other, like the downstream pipelines, right, uh, that is called aggregation pipelines, these are very specific to the feature need. So what, what we have over here is like a kind of a, some kind of a custom logic for each business use case, and we are ingesting the data and tr transforming the data for that use case, right? Uh, say, for example, one simple example could be what are the number of rides in any given area, right? And what are the, uh, like, what are the numbers of uh, drivers available in that area? So it can generate it. So these are like a very simple example, but in some cases it could be uh, very complicated as well, like how many, uh, driver, uh, like how many, uh, like what is a uh, driver who has most number of uh, rides in the last six hours or 12 hours or so? So there could be a uh, more complicated use case as well. And then at the very end, what we have is like um, the sinks or where we store all these features. We have feature store and Kafka topics. There could be many numbers, uh, many Kafka topics, depending on like what are the features that you are publishing and who is the downstream uh, consumer. For feature store, uh, we have highly customized feature store, mainly uh, because uh, most of our machine learning model at Marketplace is trying to optimize certain values uh, based on a region, right? When we're trying to search the prices, we cannot 
search the prices for one particular area. We have to look around what is the demand available, what is the supply available, and accordingly. So it is trying to optimize it. So what we do is like we store those um, feature based on the geographical indices as well. And similarly, we also do it for individual uh, data point as well. For example, fraud is not optimizing, like fraud and machine learning models are not optimizing anything for geographical reason. It is basically looking at one session and trying to determine whether it's a fraudulent activity or not. So in that case, it is just getting a data point or what you call data point for that particular individual, right? Whether it could be a driver or passenger. Yeah, so what is the next one? So we have the model inference pipelines. So model inference pipelines are the one which is basically, sorry, I take that back. Uh, it's basically model training pipeline. I think I, um, I, I move forward quickly. So uh, model training pipeline uh, is, uh, so this one is more specifically for those model uh, which are required to train the model in real time, right? Uh, some of the examples could be, you know, bias correction, which changes based on the seasonality of the day, uh, of the day or, uh, right? So that model requires you to train it more frequently. In some cases, it could, uh, some of the model they require to train after every five minutes or so, right? You, uh, and if you are using any kind of offline infrastructure, that will not work in this case. So for this use case, you have to train those model in real time. So in this pipeline, what we do is like, uh, it, is, it is basically getting all these uh, training data from all these Kafka topics and uh, like running that model uh, training and then storing that in a kind of uh, artifactory, model artifactory. But um, like how these models are getting triggered uh, for training, it basically based on some kind of uh, some smart triggers. So this smart trigger is trying to identify when all the data dependencies are met for this particular model, and then it trains that model and then uploads it. And uh, you can uh, basically configure this one based on the data dependencies as well as how frequently you want to run the model as well. Then you have model inference pipeline. And yeah, so model inference pipeline, if, as you can see over here, it's like happening in real time, but there are some use cases, and I just wanted to clarify that one. So some of the model inference that can happen synchronously, right? Like, uh, say for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call? I'm, yeah. So say for example, uh, uh, like uh, for that particular session, what are the offers that we need to give to the passenger? Like, uh, what are different rides? What will be their prices? Right? It is not based on the what do you call pre-computed value. It has to be in synchronous, like all these different data points should be passed and immediately that should be provided uh, to the passenger app, right? So, uh, but there are some models uh, uh, which can basically run in real time and then we want to uh, compute, pre-compute some of the values. Examples are uh, dynamic pricing. So what we do is uh, we run that model in asynchronous mode uh, and in this case, it is basically in the pipeline, and we compute all these value, and in that index that value in uh, one of our services for further serving. These values can also be passed on to Kafka topics. So uh, some of the downstream applications or product that they can also use it. For example, uh, real-time supply uh, management, that can also use the PT values, or sorry, the search prices or dynamic prices to compute what will be the, what you call the demand and supply, and how we are going to manage all these drivers in that particular area. Uh, yeah. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention over here is the DAG. So DAG is basically a kind of, especially for pricing models. So it is not a one model that is computing all these, uh, you know, dynamic pricing. There are different layers of model which are computing it. So the very first, like, uh, like the intermediate models, they are computing various decision variables, and then they are passing on to the next layer of the model. And eventually, it uh, reaches to the primary model, which compute the dynamic pricing, and then pass it on to the services. And we, again, we have a smart trigger over here as well, which is basically ensuring that the data dependencies are met, 
and uh, the data consistency is there, and then it triggers the model inference. And this is happening almost every minute or so, like it is computing that value for all different uh, cities and storing that uh, in the downstream services. The next one is, um, so here's a like 10,000 feet view of the whole ecosystem, like how it looks like. So from the very beginning, like uh, we have, uh, and I'm going from left to right. So uh, we have Kinesis sources. So Kinesis, so, uh, Kinesis is basically getting all these data points from uh, different sources. Uh, different sources could be driver app, passenger app, uh, our own services which are generating the data. And then we have feature pipeline which are in, uh, you know, ca computing various uh, features and then passing on to the next layer, which is basically uh, the layer which persists the feature value. So this, uh, this layer basically has feature storage uh, service. Then you have Kafka topic and then also uh, uh, ClickHouse. So as I mentioned before, uh, ClickHouse uh, is the, uh, like, sorry, uh, as I mentioned before, fraud, uh, fraud system is basically looking at the historical data and also the real-time data to predict the, uh, uh, or forecast the uh, value. So what we do is here is um, we, uh, uh, this ClickHouse is basically uh, storing uh, the short-term historical value and then providing it to the downstream uh, services. And then we have uh, S3 as well to store some of the feature for offline or uh, offline storage. And that feature can be really uh, used, like, like, uh, like that feature can be stored for a really long time, like uh, if you want to uh, analyze data and you want to see uh, what was the pattern last year or so, uh, you can use that one. And one very crucial part is also the feature monitoring service. So feature monitoring service is also very crucial for this system, especially for the real-time infrastructure. You want to identify when the feature is diverging from the ground truth, and you want to identify such kind of a data failure in real time. If you do not have this system in place, that means your prediction can you know, diverge from the actual, and it can have some uh, catastrophic failure eventually. Then uh, we have the uh, model uh, execution pipeline as I mentioned in the previous slides as well. So that is uh, executing different models and uh, predicting the values and passing on to the downstream services. There also we have the real-time configuration. Uh, and this real-time configuration is really important uh, for uh, some of the use cases. Uh, those are, which are, uh, those are uh, like uh, operation and research where you want to dynamically change the configuration parameter and see how it affects the marketplace. Uh, and we also use this one for some of the other use cases. Uh, the previous infrastructure, what we had is like when you change any configuration, it takes almost 30 to 40 minutes to basically deploy in, in the production. But once, uh, but if you're using this real-time configuration management, it deploys your changes within a minute or so. So which is really crucial, which are, or which is really important for over-related use cases as well. And then uh, at the very end, we have the various uh, downstream services or uh, downstream services which are basically using all those uh, you know, computed values. And then we have the data visualization layer. So as I mentioned before, uh, like we are, uh, especially for marketplace, we are indexing uh, values uh, for geographical area. So when we have to debug data, like uh, then if you place it on a kind of a map, and show it as a heat map, then it's much easier to you know, uh, debug any data related issue. Or similarly, we can also uh, uh, plot the, uh, what do you call, model uh, computed values, and you can compare uh, two different models on this kind of data visualization layer. And then we have high for storing all these uh, values uh, for historical purposes and S3 as well. And uh, we have a couple of other use cases like why we are storing uh, in Hive or S3 that I will cover in the next slide. So what is a DevX? Like when we are building uh, this infrastructure, what is a DevX that we have? So uh, especially for building uh, pipelines which are generating all these features, what we have done is like we have provided a kind of nice abstraction on top of the uh, what do you call it, streaming pipeline. So what you do is like instead of writing actual code, what uh, you are writing YAML configuration. 
So it is really easy for uh, you know, uh, ML engineer or, or uh, data science people to write this kind of a configuration file. And it is very intuitive. Like once you look at it, like it's very intuitive like how you can write it. So you do not have to dive deeper and figure out how like streaming pipelines should work, how you are going to code it, what are different operators available. You can basically uh, use all these UDF and you can use in this configuration file. And there are multiple UDFs which are already present in the platform, so you can directly use that. Or if you have a very uh, uh, highly customized pipeline, you can write your own UDF and you can pass it on over here. So building a pipeline becomes really easy. So instead of like spending like a couple of weeks building a pipeline, you can build in a couple of hours. Then uh, one more uh, use case or is the uh, model debugging or data replayability. So I think what we had realized over a couple of years while um, you know, deploying model in production, sometimes mo model misbehave in production. And we want to identify why, like if you do not have any system of, which is recording all these model input output, then it's kind of very hard. And once you have the model input output, you can basically replay that in. So what we have done is like we have created a connect connector that basically links to the uh, offline data store, and you can use that in Pi Notebook. And you know, ML engineers they love it because they do not have to go anywhere or any other data source to you know grab the data, clean it, or then feed it to the mo a model. Instead, they can just use this connector and then use, get the data and pass it on to the model. So it's much easier for them. And then they can literally step into the function and then they can see how the model is behaving. And this is also used, uh, especially in cases like say for example, you are developing a new model and you want to compare how it would behave in certain cases, right? So for example, last year, um, uh, last year the new Eve what happened, uh, what would happen if I deploy this model, how it will behave, right? Since uh, we stored the in, uh, uh, model input and output as well, you can feed the same input to the model and see uh, uh, what is the difference between the output and you can use the visualization layer to basically plot that and you can easily see how the new model is performing. And if the new model is performing greatly, then you can, you can basically, you can start uh, deploying that model as well. Uh, lesson learned. Um, so it was not a kind of easy, uh, what you call, journey while building this platform. Along the way, we made uh, mistakes, and then we learned from our mistake, and then we improved the whole ecosystem or uh, the platform. The very first one was that, like, we uh, like kept everything in one pipeline, which did not scale well initially. So in couple of like when we rolled it out to couple of cities, it worked really well. But when we started rolling out, then we realized there are some challenges, not only in terms of like scaling the whole infrastructure, but also the development speed. Um, and uh, like if you look closely at this pipeline, it is also generating the features, right? And when you're generating a feature, you're ingesting a lot of data from different sources. Like you're, you're ingesting like millions of data points every minute, right? And then you're processing it. The very first part of the pipeline is like, very processing heavy. And then the later part, part of the pipeline is basically the model execution. The model execution is the lighter part where you are orchestrating the data, you are making sure that all the data dependencies are met. And uh, yeah, so it, is, it was not that heavy. And when we are trying to optimize the whole pipeline, we were not able to get the right throughput uh, or, or it was not performing great at all. We learned our lessons, and then what we did is basically divided both of them. So we kept the model execution in separate pipeline and the feature generation in uh, another one, which worked great. Uh, we were able to scale it well, and also it provided another uh, operational uh, benefit of flexibility. Like when you generate a kind of a feature, right? Like initially uh, uh, you uh, just develop the feature and it is done. Like after that you are not going to touch it, right? Whereas the model one is like, you are constantly iterating on that one and you want to deploy that model uh, quickly. So in this case, like you do not have to deploy the feature pipeline, like the feature pipeline is already deployed, you just need to do the model execution pipeline. 
and like and both of them are like um, uh, isolated so uh, you do not have to worry about the feature generation pipeline you just deploy the model execution and and, and it worked fine but creating that will that also uh, you know like having the feature um, like we had you know like many pipelines after that which was still not grateful uh, what we realize is most of the pipelines are doing this data cleaning and uh, you know data hydration again and again like the same logic was repeated across different pipelines we realized to think um, like people are going crazy and just building all these pipelines so why don't we just standardize some of the things right so what we did is like we further split the pipeline into two one is the data ingestion and enriching pipeline uh, which is basically getting all this data, enriching them, and providing a more kind of hydrated data, and, uh, which is high quality as well, and it is also tagged. And then, then you have the downstream uh, uh, aggregation pipeline, which are just getting those data which is relevant to them, and then, uh, then it, uh, processing it further, and passing it on to the feature store or Kafka topic. Then, uh, uh, what are the uh, lessons learned uh, or during this one. So, uh, like other lessons learned during this uh, while building the platform. One is the standardization. Like, if you keep on building and making it easier to build the pipeline, then people will go crazy. They will build multiple pipelines. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it is like very similar pipeline generating with very similar features, and it is it is like it is good to have that kind of flexibility but then you are getting some operational cost, extra operational cost as well. So it's better to standardize it, and, and when you do the standardization, you also need to make sure that like, whatever the naming convention on all those things are correct, and you are passing all this information to some kind of a feature discovery system. Uh, I think I didn't mention in the earlier slide, but we do have Amundsen, uh, which is also a, a open source, uh, so you can pretty much index all this feature, and if you have a kind of very standard name for any feature, then it's much easier to find that feature uh, uh, in Amundsen. And once you have the standardization, then you do not have to repeat yourself again and again. The other one is the guideline. Um, so we also realize uh, that many people are building all these, but they are repeating some of the mistakes that we had made earlier. And one way of like doing that or preventing that is the guideline. So what we did is basically we came up with all different guidelines, like when you are creating a pipeline, how you are going to shard the data, how you are going to process it, where you are going to store it, uh, and all this. So once we have this kind of uh, guideline in place, then people were not making the same mistake again and again. So it was much easier for them to just follow the guideline and then focus mainly on the business use case. And then another one is the better abstraction for usability. So whenever you are building any kind of platform, it's, it is better to abstract out all these uh, uh, you know, layers. It helps you, uh, like because uh, as I mentioned earlier, right, when uh, data scientists and ML engineers, they want to uh, generate a new feature or run any model, they do not want to dive deeper into the infrastructure code and figure out how you can do it. Like, it's better to provide a kind of better abstraction so they can just focus on the interfaces and then you know, they can just program the interfaces and that's it. So that also helped us to you know, iterate faster. Uh, they can just completely focus on uh, you know, business logic or developing model and then they can iterate faster. Uh, and that worked uh, really great for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and like a couple of use cases like you know, uh, the YAML based uh, pipeline, that worked great uh, and similarly, when we provided a way of like debugging uh, their model code or replaying the data, that worked really well. Uh, so they do not have to look into how they are fetching the data, what is the source, and all those things. Everything is uh, provided in one place. And then the last one is, uh, I think, the data points, like uh, um, how uh, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, like how, at what scale our platform are working. So currently, uh, this platform is powering all the marketplace uh, you know, use cases, like uh, dynamic pricing, driver incentive, real-time supply management, uh, yeah. And uh, right now, this, basically, this infrastructure is computing tens of millions of uh, features, uh, oh, sorry, tens of millions of features, uh, sorry, tens of millions of geohashes, 
It is computing tens, uh, various features for tens of millions of geohashes, and then also uh, uh, we are forecasting for all the different marketplaces uh, for almost uh, 350 plus regions, and uh, uh, we are computing driver incentive uh, for all 1 million data uh, for 1 million hotspots.